Uh, welcome back. Hope everybody had a restful break. Uh, spent lots of time doing syntax in their spare time. Um, let's do a little syntax. Now, uh, I don't have any announcements. Uh, are there any questions about the things that I'm not announcing? There are things that people are like wondering about before we start. Okay, so I just wanted to start with some review, just to remind everybody where we were. We were drawing trees like this one. <clears throat> um, so here's a tree for I will tickle the child with the feather. Um, it's a tree that has various kinds of information in it about, um, well, various things, including uh, substrings that we think are treated as constituents for various kinds of syntactic phenomena. So, you know, uh, this tree is meant to reflect the fact that um, this sentence, uh, first of all, has a meaning uh, in which I'm going to use a feather to tickle, tickle a child. That's the meaning that's been diagrammed here. Uh, and that if you perform certain operations that uh, make it clear that this is the tree that you've got, like um, topicalizing the child, moving the child to the beginning of the sentence, you know, the child I will tickle with the feather, uh, that that's the only, in fact, the only meaning that you can have is the, the meaning that goes with this tree. Is this all sounding vaguely familiar? Are there questions about this tree? Is anybody looking at this tree and thinking, wait, which class am I in again? What, what is going on? Why? I'm going to talk about this tree in a little bit of detail today, but I just want to make sure there's nothing here that's shocking or, or distressing anybody. OK. So um, one of the things we've talked about is that some of the properties of that tree follow from selection. Uh, so we have this idea that there's a special kind of relation that can hold between uh, heads, uh, so the, the smallest things in the tree, the things that just have words under them, um, things like the verb, uh, a relation that can hold between those heads and other kinds of phrases in the sentence. So we've said that the verb tickle selects the object noun phrase, the child. And what we mean by that is that uh, the relation between the verb tickle and the object, the child, is special in that not every verb can be followed by an object. Uh, uh, so, you know, you can tickle a child, you can devour a child, you shouldn't, but it's grammatical. You can write a child, sort of, uh, but there are other verbs uh, for which you just can't do this. You can't thrive the child. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, so there are some verbs, the classic way to say this is there are some verbs that are transitive and others that are intransitive. Uh, so in order to know whether you can have an object or not, whether the there can be a noun phrase in that position or not, the sister of the verb, you got to know what the verb is. The verb tells you whether it needs to have an object or not. Um, so there's this relation of selection that holds between the verb and the object. Uh, the idea is when we look up words like tickle and devour and write in our mental lexicon, uh, we'll see various things about them, including how they're pronounced, uh, but also uh, whether they can have objects or not, whether they select for noun phrase sisters or not. Um, so when we ask, going back to the tree, why is the sister of the verb, the noun phrase, the child, um, the answer, one way of interpreting that question, the answer is, well, it's because the verb tickle selects for a noun phrase sister, uh, and so you give it one. Now, that's why the tree has that, that bit of structure. And we can tell that kind of story about a lot of parts of this tree. So similarly, we're going to want to say that the preposition with selects for uh, a sister that's a noun phrase, the feather. Right? And for that matter, we'll probably want to say that the T, will, is selecting for a verb phrase. That's why the T has a verb phrase, it's its sister. Um, so there are various places in this tree where a head has a particular sister, uh, and it's because the head is selecting for that as its sister. Um, we also said that this relation of selection that uh, is something that heads can do, they can select for properties of their sister, um, that sometimes, at least, they select more specifically than that. They select for sisters uh, where the sister's head has a particular property. So uh, I think the example I gave you last time was verb, the verb depend, um, where the verb depend needs a prepositional phrase sister, uh, but it specifically needs a prepositional phrase sister in which the preposition is on. Uh, so you have to depend on things. You can't depend from them or depend at them. You can't just have any preposition there. Has to be has to be on. Um, so uh, there are verbs like depend, and there are many verbs like this uh, that select for a particular prepositional phrase sisters, but in particular prepositional phrase sisters that have a particular preposition. Yeah. 
sometimes it's less particular than that. So uh, I think in class I said, um, I said, he said, vamping until he could get some chalk out, that uh, the verb put seems to select for a noun phrase sister and a prepositional phrase sister. So you put the book on the table or in the refrigerator or under the car or whatever, wherever it is you want to put the book. Um, so the put has to have a noun phrase object, doesn't have to be the book, can be any noun phrase. And then there can be a prepositional phrase. Um, put is not like depend, there are a variety of prepositions that can be here, but you can't just have any preposition here. So you can't say put the book during the party. Um, that's, not a, that's not a possible sentence. Um, and we might hope to derive that from properties of the meaning of put, right? So the prepositional phrase that goes with put needs to specify a location, right? Uh, and during the party doesn't specify a location unless we're thinking of time as space, which as long as syntax is not uh, Doctor Who, I think we're okay. Yeah? So for clarity, uh, you suggest merge only with binary. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, so merge is only binary, and that means if we're going to have a tree for these kinds of sentences, we're going to need to put uh, the verb put, and since we want the noun phrase to be to be next, that's what this seems to tell us. We'll have a noun phrase here, and then we'll have a prepositional phrase. That's one possible answer to your question. If merge is going to be binary. If merge is going to be binary, we're going to want to say, yeah, um, put is something that needs two things. Uh, we're going to have to give them to it one at a time. We can't give them both to it at once. Otherwise, if we wanted to do that, we would need to use ternary merge. Right? We'd need to merge three things at once. And so we'll merge them one at a time. We'll first give it the noun phrase, and then we'll give it the prepositional phrase. Why do we first give it the noun phrase and then the prepositional phrase? Why don't we say, put on the table the book? Uh, we might actually get to that, but we're not going to get to it today. So this is one possible answer to your question. Another possible answer to your question, of course, would be to say, ah, we've discovered that we were wrong to say that there's binary merge, right? That uh, here's a place where we need there to be ternary merge. This is going to interact with things we're going to want to say about how selection works. So I have now a couple of times said a thing gets to select for the properties of its sister, right? And here it's selecting for properties of its sister, but this is not its sister, right? This is something else. It's, it's, uh, Never mind, I can't figure out the family relation between these two points on the tree. It's its, um, uh, what is it? It's its ant, yeah. <laughs> the prepositional phrase is the ant of the verb. That's not how, how actual syntacticians talk about this kind of thing. So they're not sisters. Um, uh, so you know, two kinds of things we can say. Oh, what we're discovering is uh, that we need ternary merge. We need these to both be sisters. Another would be to say, oh, um, we're discovering that uh, Selection isn't necessarily for properties of your sister. It's something more like you select things. Uh, the first things that you merge must be things that you select. We're going to circle around and talk about that in a second. So to say something more elaborate about how you select. Uh, so that's a really good question. What we really need to do is develop tests that will tell us whether this is the right tree for something like this, or whether we would rather have something like this, where there's a verb and a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase, and merge doesn't have to be, to be binary. Um, just to cheat a little bit, what we'll what we'll find out what we would find out when we develop these kinds of tests is that this is not the kind of tree that we want. We we want trees that are like this. But uh, we're going to have to do some work to develop those tests. Here we go. I have a scary thought. Oh no. The thought is like um, so about selection. Yeah. I feel like there are some verbs like you say board, like you board a ship. Kind yep. of has like a secret selection inside of it because you could think of board as like get on the ship. Oh, and so I see. So you'd be like, ah, get is selecting for on the like you know, on the ship a certain type of prepositional phrase, mm -hmm. or you could like have just board, which kind of includes it inside of it. Like it also yep. in Spanish, if you have words like buscar, which is like to look for. Yeah. And so it's like, could you think of put as a verb that like maybe like if English had been different, you could have a, a verb like. You, know, you, you put the refrigerator, everyone knows it means put in the refrigerator. Yeah, 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 I see what you mean. So you're, you're pointing out something, something important, which is that, um, uh, here, let's do look for. 
you know, but in English, we're going to want to have a verb look that selects for a prepositional phrase uh, where the preposition is for. Um, but that there are other languages like Spanish in which there's a single verb that means look for. For that matter, in English, there's a, there's a verb seek. So it's kind of dramatic. But uh, if I go into a bookstore and say I'm looking for a book, that's the normal thing for me to say. I could also go into a bookstore and say I am seeking a book. Um, they would probably direct me to the you know, fantasy science fiction section you know, if, I, if I did that. Um, uh, but those are both two ways to say the same thing. Um, so, so maybe you know, the way to think about this is, yeah, Spanish doesn't have a verb that means look for. It has a verb that means seek. And, and um, you know, there. Uh, uh, yeah, so or maybe another way to say this, and this is going to be important as you guys are doing uh, your work with the languages that you're working on, um, is that you shouldn't necessarily expect the selectional properties of a verb to be the same uh, from one language to the next. That uh, if you are inclined to think of Spanish, is it buscar, uh, as the equivalent of look for, that we want to think of, um, uh, of that as, as that English is a verb, look, that selects for a prepositional phrase. Spanish has a verb, buscar, that's like seek. It selects for a, for a noun phrase complement. Um, yeah, so you want to be careful as you are going from language to language. Uh, you can't trust selectional restrictions. Um, and indeed, so I've used put as the example of a verb that has two things that it seems to select. But there are probably examples of verbs that select uh, two things where the two things are, say, both noun phrases. So take a verb like give the children books. So here we want there to be two noun phrases uh, coming together with give, and give uh, selects those. It's, um, it's a property of give that it can, it can have two noun phrases after it, and not every verb can do that. Put, for example, can't. Yeah. So even verbs that are fairly similar in their meaning, like donate. Uh, so you can't donate the children books. You have to donate books to the children. Yeah. Um, so yes, there, uh, as so often in this class, I'm showing you the easiest examples here. And as so often in this class, you guys are immediately saying, wait, wait, what about the complicated examples? So yes, there are more complicated examples. We'll, we'll try to get to them. Cases where you're selecting more than one thing. We'll come back to that. We'll talk about it more now. Yes. So if we use the technology that we have right now, we're kind of compelled to have a tree like this one. Sorry, I wrote this as a capital N because I knew I was about to write a noun phrase. Um, give the children books. You know, so where uh, give needs to, to combine with two noun phrases and merge is binary, and so we'll do binary merge twice. Um, that's the kind of tree that we could draw with the techniques that we have right now. I, I hope I hedged enough in there to make you feel emotionally um, grounded enough that if it turns out later that that's not the right tree, that you won't be too disappointed. Because we're going to talk more about this stuff. Our, our understanding will get more sophisticated. But given everything I'm telling you right now, that's the tree we expect. Yes? Um, do these trees have to have like, words or sentence? I'm sorry, I missed the middle of that. Uh, do, does, do these trees have to have like, exactly each and every word of each sentence? Or could it like fill in some like uh, words? Like, for example, I learned in elementary school the subject of every Oh, oh, so, oh. Mm -hmm. like, could, could you have, like, two mm -hmm. in parentheses in one of these? Oh, I see. Give to the children's books. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. Oh, that's a really, that's a really, that's a really interesting and difficult question. Um, the short answer is yes. There are, there absolutely are places where we're going to want to say, I'm showing you trees in which I'm not showing you trees anymore. I'm showing you a nebula. Give me just a second. Um, I'm showing you trees in which every uh, terminal node, every head, has one word under it. Uh, and you're wondering, could, it be, could there be trees where there are nodes that don't have anything under them or don't have anything pronounced under them? Um, 
And indeed, uh, the short answer is yes, there surely are going to be such trees. Your example is a good one. Um, do I want to go off and talk about that? Yeah, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, we, um, we talked a little bit before. We're going to come back to this later. We talked a little bit before about, um, uh, yeah, we can do this fast. Um, uh, constraints on things that pronouns and names can refer to. So for example, we talked about the fact that if you say she likes Sally, that's a perfectly fine sentence. But it can't mean uh, that she and Sally are the same person. Right, so she has to refer to somebody other than Sally. And we, we developed a, a, a rule that has that consequence. And I promised you that we would talk about that rule in more depth later on. Here's another kind of case. Um, if you say something like, Sally uh, defended herself, there's this special expression, herself. Uh, and it has to refer to Sally, right? So Sally defended herself means Sally defended Sally. Right? So uh, herself refers back to whoever the subject is. Um, if this had been Mary defended herself, well, it would have to be Mary defending Mary. If it had been I defended myself, well, then you have to use this special form of these words, these self words. They're called reflexives. Um, these reflexives have to refer back to something else in the sentence. In these examples, they always refer to the subject. Yeah? Um, and they have to do that, right? So you can't say things like, I defended herself or himself. Right? These are out. Yeah. So uh, the reflexive that's at the end of these sentences has to refer back to the subject in these cases. Um, and the form of the reflexive tells you something about what the subject is. So uh, you get, uh, it, it's got this, uh, so hmm, you get herself when the subject is you know, feminine and third person, and you get myself when the subject is first person. And, and if it were you defended, it would be defended yourself. Yeah. So this reflexive is telling you that it's referring back to you. Yeah, this means you defended you. Yeah. I'm telling you all this because your example from elementary school is a really good one. If I tell you, defend yourself, it's a command. Well, everything that we've now learned about these reflexives leads us to hope that there's a you in that sentence. Because, well, that's what reflexives seem to do. They refer back to the subject, and, and the, they have a form that tells you something about what the subject is. In this case, they tell you that the subject is you, which is what you were taught in elementary school. Yeah. Um, so you say, defend yourself, and that's fine. And you cannot say, defend himself or defend myself. Right? Just as you cannot say, you defended, you can say, you defended yourself, but not, you defended myself himself or herself. Yeah? So indeed, there are some good reasons to think that whoever told you that there's a you in this sentence was right. You can kind of detect the you by using these reflexives. Yeah? So uh, there are indeed words that are not pronounced. Uh, and if we were going to draw a tree for defend yourself, we'd probably want to say, yeah, there's a you in subject position. And there would have to be a rule saying, don't pronounce that particular you. So the shorter answer to your question is yes, there are parts of trees that are not pronounced. And we may get a chance to talk more about it. All right, that was a tangent. Any other questions? Let me take us back to this main line here. OK. Um, where are we? Yeah, so selection. Uh, heads select for properties of their sisters, although several of you want to know what happens when they seem to have more than one thing that they select. And I'm uh, trying to. Well, I'm not exactly ruthlessly suppressing that question, but I'm telling you what we currently seem to have to say about it, and maybe uh, flagging the possibility that we'll have to say different things later. Yeah. OK, so far, so good? So yeah, um, 
Right. And when selection is for something specific, so this is the this was the point I was trying to make with this slide. Uh, when a verb selects for something specific, uh, a verb can, for example, say, I need a prepositional phrase, and I need the preposition to be on. Um, or I need a prepositional phrase, this is like put, I need a prepositional phrase, and I need the preposition to be something locative it's to describe a location. Yeah. Um, so depend selects for a prepositional phrase with the head on. We're never going to find, for example, a verb that selects for a prepositional phrase, and I don't care what the preposition is, but the object must be tomatoes. We won't find anything like that. So uh, verbs select for their sisters, sisters in all the cases I'm going to show you, um, they select for their sisters, but what they select specifically is sisters with a particular head. They don't say things like, I select for a sister whose complement you know, must be this, or which must contain a tomato, or you know, which must be modified by an adverb. You know, heads don't do things like that. They select for properties of their sisters, specifically the heads of their sisters. Um, and once we know that, this is what I said in class last time, we uh, can sort of use that fact about selection uh, to detect other heads, um, so other kinds of things that seem to be in this selection relation with other uh, words in the sentence, other heads in the sentence. So when we see other cases where uh, there's a particular word in the sentence um, whose value seems to be determined by another word in the sentence, we get to think, oh, okay, maybe that's a selection relation. This was the example I gave you last time. Verbs uh, seem to be able to select for properties of the clause that follows them. Uh, so there are verbs like think that can be followed by a clause. Not every verb can be followed by a clause, right? So uh, I devoured the pizza. Devour can be followed by a noun phrase. But I devoured that I have won the lottery uh, doesn't make sense. So this looks like a selection relation. And specifically, it's a selection relation that's picky about these words that introduce the clause, that come at the beginning of the clause. Uh, words like that and whether. So think can be followed by a clause where the word that introduces the clause is that. You can say things like, I think that I have won the lottery. Wonder can be followed by a clause where the word that introduces the following clause is whether, as in I wonder whether I have won the lottery. And these verbs can't be switched. So you can say, I think that I have won the lottery. You cannot say, I think one, whether I have won the lottery. You can say, I wonder whether I have won the lottery. You cannot say, I wonder that I have won the lottery. And I was saying, this looks kind of like depend and on. Think needs a clause that starts with that. Wonder needs a clause that starts with whether. Depend needs a prepositional phrase that has on in it. And just like with depend and on, we said, yeah, depend is selecting for a prepositional phrase with a particular head. Uh, we get to say, oh, OK, apparently that and whether are the heads of the clause that's getting selected by the verb. So think and wonder are selecting for clauses that are headed by words like that and whether. We have a word for. Words like that and whether we call them complementizers. Um, I think I apologized for that word last time. I'll just apologize for it again because it's probably not the word you learned for those things uh, in elementary school or high school. You might have uh, uh, heard them called uh, conjunctions, subordinating conjunctions. There are lots of things people call them. Um, but in linguistics, we call them complementizers. So I'll have to ask you to join me in calling them that. Um, so the abbreviation for complementizer is C. Uh, and the phrase the, is the sister of verbs like think and wonder is a complementizer phrase, a CP. It's a phrase that's headed by that or whether these complementizers. Yeah. OK? So I'll review. Hopefully, it sounds at least vaguely familiar. OK. So now here we are back at the original tree. I will tickle the child with the feather. <clears throat> We've talked a lot about selection relations. We've said that selection relations are relations between heads and uh, Phrases, in many cases, the sister uh, of the head. And in particular, um, selection relations seem to be picky about, uh, when there is pickiness, about the uh, head of the, the phrase that's getting selected. So we've seen examples of that now with prepositional phrases and now with uh, complementizer phrases, CPs, uh, clauses. Yeah. But, and this is near the end of what we did last time, there's more to life than selection. Um, not much more, but a little more. So uh, uh, we don't want to say that tickle or child is selecting with a feather, right? So uh, when I told you that uh, tickle is selecting the child, one of the ways I tried to convince you of that was to say, yeah, 
not every verb can be followed by an object. There are transitive verbs and intransitive verbs. That's the kind of thing that makes us think we're looking at a selection relation. But any verb can be followed by with the feather. You can do anything with a feather. You can tickle a child with a feather. You can devour a child with a feather. You can write a novel with a feather. You can thrive with a feather. Feathers, they're just very, very flexible tools. You can do anything with them. Again, some of these things make more sense than others. So it's not clear what you mean when you say that you will thrive with a feather. Uh, or for that matter, well, it's actually fairly clear what you mean when you say you'll devour a child with a feather. It just doesn't bear thinking about too closely. Um, uh, but basically, you can do anything with a feather. There's nothing like verbs are transitive and intransitive. So this particular prepositional phrase, this sort of instrument, uh, can go together with anything. Um, and so we don't seem to want to say that there is a selection relation between this prepositional phrase and anything at all. Um, so there's a distinction that we draw between um, what are called arguments and what are called adjuncts. So arguments. Uh, like the child, and I will tickle the child with a feather, are things that are selected by something, in this case the verb. And adjuncts are just phrases that wandered in. Um, they're not selected by anything. They're just there because they want to be. Um, they're not selected by anything. You get to put them in because you feel like it. They're often modifiers, uh, sort of like this one. OK, so there are arguments, and then there are adjuncts. Um, how do you tell whether something is an argument or an adjunct? I think I warned you last time, this is something that people often get confused by, and so I want to be clear about it. Um, again, when we decided that the child is selected by tickle, what we were doing was saying, not every verb can be followed by an object. So if you're going to have a child right after the verb, you have to know what verb it is. There are transitive verbs and intransitive verbs, and some verbs are okay with the following object, and others are not. Um, that's the signature of a selection relation. So the arguments are picky about which heads they can combine with, and adjuncts are not. What people sometimes get confused about is, is thinking that it's sort of the opposite, that the, the pickiness goes in the opposite direction. So people think, here's a verb that needs to have an object, and I've probably said things that led you down this garden path. So there are indeed verbs that are obligatorily transitive. I think the example I gave before was devour. So, you know, the dragon devoured uh, pizza. So we've devoured enough children for one class, um, possibly too many. The, the dragon devoured the pizza. Devour actually has to combine with an object, not only is this a selection relation because not just any verb can have an object, but actually devour has to combine with an object. Um, it's ungrammatical without the pizza. So if I take out the pizza, it becomes stuck. Yeah. Uh, so the dragon devoured, that's not a sentence. Okay. So that's an argument which is actually obligatory. Devour has to be transitive. <clears throat> but there are plenty of verbs that, in fact, it's more common for verbs to be optionally transitive. So uh, devour needs to have an object. But eat, which means almost the same thing as devour, uh, is a, it's, the transitivity is optional. You can say I ate an apple, but you can also say I ate. Um, obligatorily transitive verbs are actually kind of rare. Um, and the best ones are kind of violent. Uh, they're things like eviscerate and you know, devour and mutilate. Those are the really clear transitive verbs. They're very handy uh, in syntax classes. Yes? I, we're, we're talking as though any adjunct can modify anything. And um, I mean, so uh, this is another one of those places where we have to carefully distinguish between syntax and semantics. Um, there are surely things that it's very difficult to imagine anybody doing with a feather, right? But um, those kinds of cases, so what's an example? Um, uh, she, she proved uh, Fermat's last theorem with a feather, right? I don't know how she would do that, right? Um, but that's a, that's a math problem. That's not a syntax problem. So uh, the sentence is grammatical. Uh, we just can't figure out, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to draw a picture of it. Does that make sense? So yeah, what we're saying is that that prepositional phrase can combine with anything in principle, though there may be kinds of combinations that will give us meanings that are kind of hard to understand. Yeah, Joseph. 
are the most transitive ones? I think it is. Yeah, yeah. There's something about violence and transitivity. Yeah. Something to think about as you're working on your languages, if you want to. Um, OK, so arguments are picky about what heads they combine with. But there are, uh, to, to look at things from the other perspective, if you're asking for a particular head, um, if, you're, if you see a head and it's followed by a phrase, the question to ask yourself is not, is that phrase optional? People often ask that question. And it's, it's a question that gets you in the wrong direction. There, there are plenty of examples of things that are, in fact, arguments, but they're optional. OK? All right. Um, and then I think this is the last thing we did last time. I was trying to illustrate arguments and adjuncts to you. And we sort of got, we were in the middle of deciding on the boat. So, uh, so let's decide on the boat again uh, fairly quickly. So what we decided was that the sentence, I decided on the boat, can mean at least two things. It can mean either I had some decision to make and I made it while I was on the boat. Right? Or it can mean I chose the boat. Right? I was trying to choose between the boat and something else, and I chose the boat. Yeah. Um, and what we said was, uh, if we ask the prepositional phrase on the boat, is that an argument or an adjunct? Um, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, it can be an adjunct. I made my decision. The, when it has the meaning, when this sentence means I made my decision while I was on the boat, then on the boat is an adjunct. Uh, you can kind of see why. Just like you can do anything with a feather, you can do anything on the boat. Right? So any phrase, you can modify it with on the boat. Um, uh, this particular prepositional phrase, then, uh, is an adjunct uh, in that reading. Yeah. Have to be careful, because, of course, if I say things like, it depends on the boat, or uh, for that, well, let's use that one. It depends on the boat. Uh, this is a case where there is a selection relation between depend and on, right? Um, uh, we've been talking about that before, that depend selects for a prepositional phrase for which the head is on. Yeah? So you can't just look at a prepositional. If, I ask, if someone asks you out of the blue, is on the boat an argument or an adjunct? In a way, that's the point of this slide, too. The answer is, wait, what's the rest of the sentence, right? Because uh, you have to find out what the relationship is between that prepositional phrase and the other words that are around it. So in the reading where I decided on the boat means I made my decision while I was on the boat, on the boat is an adjunct. It's just describing the location where uh, the rest of the sentence took place. And uh, any sentence can take place on the boat, maybe. As opposed to uh, the reading where it means I chose the boat, there it's an argument. Uh, because again, you know, the fact that decide on means choose is kind of an idiosyncratic property of the verb decide and the preposition on. Uh, it's like if you look up decide in the lexicon, uh, you know, it's gonna have there, we're gonna have to list the information that it can optionally select an argument that starts with on and that the result of that combination means choose. Right? If you think about other things that mean something pretty similar to decide, like make up your mind, right? So I made up my mind on the boat. Uh, only means the first thing, I think, right? If I made up my mind on the boat means I made my decision while I was on the boat. It doesn't mean I chose the boat, right? I, I made a choice between the boat and something else, and I chose the boat, right? So it's not a property of expressions that mean decide that they always combine with on to mean this. It's an idiosyncratic property of decide. Um, it's kind of like we have to list for particular verbs that they're transitive or that they're not. We have to list for the word decide that it combines with on to give you a meaning that's something like choose. I'm sorry, I'm talking over you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, another good example. So uh, you can look up, a, uh, look up a reference. Well, so you can look up. Yeah. Um, and that up is probably, a, probably an adjunct, right? Uh, you can do anything up. Um, but uh, to look up a reference, the fact that that means, you know, look through some stuff and find it. That's an idiosyncratic fact about look and up. And uh, 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 that's, a, that's another good example of an argument. Yeah, nice example. Yeah? OK. Um, and then, I think this is where we stopped. Uh, I asked you to think about sentences like, I decided on the boat on the plane. And I asked you to suppress your natural urge to make things more complicated uh, and to think of alternatives. 
Um, so consider situations in which there's only one boat and only one plane, and neither of them is on the other, right? Um, there are two things that you could imagine this meaning, right? It could mean I chose the boat while I was on the plane, or it could mean, in principle, I chose the plane while I was on the boat, right? If we've decided that decide and on can combine in these ways. But I think the fact generally was that it only has one of those readings. Is that the reading that people have? I'll write the readings down. One is uh, chose the boat while on the plane. And the other was chose the plane while I was on the boat. Yeah? How many of you can get it to mean this first thing? How many of you can get it to mean the second thing? A few of you. The few of you who can get it to mean the second thing, please meet with your classmates after class and get them to convince you, or maybe you could convince them that they're wrong. I think um, what we, we talked about this a little bit in class, possibly, that uh, if I say, for me at least, and people should stop me if this is not true, um, I can get it to mean the second thing, but I need an opera score. I have to say it in a particular way. I have to say something like, I decided on the boat, on the plane. There have to be commas, uh, and I have to kind of squash on the boat a little bit in order to get it to have this second meaning. Those of you who are considering raising your hands the second time, is that true of you? Or are you people who, who can just say, I decided on the boat on the plane and mean this? Some of you are raising thumbs and nodding and things like that. Is there anybody who, that thing that I just said when I pronounced it in that particular way, is there anybody who, who did not think, oh yeah, that's the way I was pronouncing it in my head when I said that I could have it be this way? Let me say it again. Is there anybody who, if you say, I decided on the boat on the plane, saying it that way, can it mean this, the second thing? Yes? Uh, I feel like uh, that's where the plane sentence is more than usual than the written word. Like, I still have to say it in a different way to get the same meaning. Uh -huh. Oh, 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 I see. How do you have to say it in order to get the second reading? Oh, OK. <laughs> fair, fair enough, fair enough. I, this is one of many places where um, I think I'm going to be content with the fact that all of you raised your hands when I asked whether it could mean this, and only a few of you raised your hands when I asked whether it could mean this. I think maybe the ones of you who can get it to mean this are doing it by pronouncing it in an especially interesting way, which is itself an interesting fact, right? Um, there is, I think I've alluded to this a couple of times, uh, a topic of study that people work on trying to figure out what the rules are for how the pitch of your voice rises and falls as you speak and where you put in pauses and so on. It's the study of what's sometimes called prosody. It's very complicated and hard, um, but it's really interesting. Um, so maybe the short thing for me to say is on a prosody where there's nothing special, where we're not doing any pausing or, or downgrading of anything, where we're just reading this straight through, I think everybody prefers this to this. Let me say that for, for the time being. Um, so I decided on the boat on the plane. When you've got these two on phrases after decide, the sort of tendency anyway, unless you do fancy prosodic things, is to have the first one be the argument and the second one be the adjunct. Um, so what we're finding out then is that if you've got a head and it has both an argument and an adjunct, the argument is closer to the head. Yeah. Uh, we're going to come back to that, but you know, a, a way to think about it, and, and we'll come back to it and say this more formally in a second, it's as though, I think I have a tree that I can make use of here, um, it's as though if you're going to have a verb like decide that's going to have two prepositional phrases after it, um, so and forget what these are for now. And also we'll have on the boat and on the plane. 
you know. So you've got decide, and it's going to have two prepositional phrases after it, and decide optionally selects for a prepositional phrase with on as, uh, as the head. But what we're say- seeing is it's as though if you pick the version of decide, that's like if you decide to have decide select for something, um, it's as though when you're merging these two prepositional phrases to projections of the verb, um, you need to merge the one that's selected first. There's some kind of urgency about this selection relation. Um, you don't just uh, get to freely decide what order to merge these two prepositional phrases in, the argument and the adjunct. You need to hurry up and give it its selectional requirements, something like that. And we'll, we'll come back and talk more about that. Okay. Incidentally, well, who cares? Um, incidentally, that way of talking about things no, sorry, let, let, me, let me wait until we get more formal about it to, to make the next point. The next point is that this may help us some with the kinds of cases that got me to write that tree in the first place, the kinds of cases where a head seems to select for more than one thing. Um, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so that's where we were last time, I think. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about any of that? This has been an attempt to review because I know you've had a week during which you might not have spent every waking moment thinking about syntax. I, I don't know why, but... I guess young people today, they have their priorities. Are there other, other questions about this? Or are there things that aren't clear? OK. Yeah? Why couldn't you, or I guess it seems to me that like decide and decide on are almost like two different verbs. Yeah. Or why couldn't you merge decide with on to have that be like a verb phrase and make an argument that is the argument that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're wondering. Or decide on the on the bows. Why not do uh, decide on, and then combine that whole thing with a noun phrase, the boat, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, notice that these are making different claims about whether on the boat is a constituent or not. Right. Um, and so, for example, one of the constituency tests that we fooled around with was um, the one where I'm amazed by, by something that you've said, and I repeat part of what you've said in amazement. So if you say, I decided on the boat, I, one thing I can surely say is the boat. Right? But I think I can also say, on the boat? So I don't think so, right? Yeah, so look up the reference. That's a good example. Uh, look up the reference. If I'm amazed when you say I looked up the reference, if I say up the reference, that's weird. I have a lifetime's experience being weird. And that's, you know, I think that's worse than I decided on the boat. On the boat? I think. But yeah. Uh, that's that's the claim. Notice there's another difference between look up the reference and decide on the boat. You can also say look the reference up. You cannot say decide the boat on. So we probably don't want these to be the same. Yeah. Uh, it's another reason to think that they're different. Yeah. If you're uh, familiar with German, German has a zillion particles like this where you're yeah putting things between the verb and the separable prefix, they're called. Yeah? Okay. Uh, okay, so so okay. So now, hopefully, I've got you willing to entertain at least temporarily the possibility that there are uh, things that we can describe as arguments and adjuncts. Arguments are the things that are selected by other heads. Adjuncts are <laughs> phrases that just wandered in by mistake. Uh, nothing is selecting them. They're just here because they want to be. Um, uh, they're not here because they're satisfying any needs of anything at all. They're 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 parasites. Basically, is what they are. They they end up in here. Uh, inside the, the clause. Um, and I've shown you one kind of test for them, which is that if you have uh, a head that is combining both with an argument and with an adjunct, it looks like there's at least a tendency for the argument to want to be closer to the head than the adjunct. Right? So decide on the boat on the plane. You, the argument -y reading, the choose reading, goes with the first one. It's, that means chose the boat on the plane. Yeah. I want to show you another test for uh, arguments versus adjuncts. Um, here's another sentence. I decided on the boat, and Mary decided on the plane. That can mean at least two things, I think. 
possibly four, but at least two. One thing that it can mean is I chose the boat and Mary chose the plane. And another thing it can mean is Mary and I both had decisions to make. We had to decide whether to major in linguistics or not. And I made my decision while I was on the boat, and she made hers while she was on the plane. Yeah. Right. So it could mean that, too. I guess it could also mean I chose the boat, and Mary decided to become a linguistics major while she was on the plane. Maybe. I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, it can mean at least those two things. Yeah. OK. Now, consider this sentence. I decided on the boat. And Mary did so on the plane. Does that mean two things? I don't think so. What does that one mean? Joseph? Yeah, exactly. So I made the right decision on the boat, and Mary did, made the wrong decision on the plane. Yeah, yeah, I can mean that. Um, yes, so there's a phenomenon called VP pronominalization. That is, you're, you're taking the VP uh, decide on, the, or decide, I guess, and you're replacing it with uh, do so, which is kind of like a pronoun. Uh, it's like a pronoun in that it's an expression that can stand in for lots of different kinds of verb phrases. So just like, you know, a pronoun like she can stand in for any female person uh, do so can stand in for you know, lots of kinds of verb phrases. Um, and what we're learning is that if you do that, uh, the phrase that's outside of do so on the plane um, can, uh, can only be an adjunct. It can't be an argument. There are various ways we could think about this. But here's one. We could say, look, um, this is the argument. is the adjunct. We said there's a special relation of selection between decide and the argument right? that doesn't hold between decide and the adjunct. The adjunct is just here because it wants to be. So there's a selection relation between these two things. And then the adjunct is just something you merge because, well, you've got it and you can merge it. Yeah. Um, yeah? That's what we've been saying. And maybe what we're learning here is that yeah, decide. If you look up decide in the lexicon, you're going to see that it has the option of selecting for a prepositional phrase headed by on. But if you look up do so in the lexicon, well, it doesn't select anything. There aren't any selectional relations with do so. Yeah. So do so is kind of blank. It just means there's a verb phrase. And you know, look around at the rest of the sentence to figure out what the verb phrase is. Yeah. But uh, there's a verb phrase. So it's not doing any selecting. So if you see a prepositional phrase after do so, it's not an argument of anything. Uh, it had better be an adjunct. I guess that's what we're learning here. I told you this is another test for arguments and adjuncts. If you do VP pronominalization, if you replace the verb phrase with do so and you have a phrase left over, uh, then that thing had better not be uh, an argument. It had better be an adjunct. The action with arguments and adjuncts so far has been with uh, prepositional phrases. Um, we've talked as though direct objects, for example, are always arguments. And so what we expect is that a direct object will never be able to be left over like this. That is, you won't be able to say, I chose the boat. And Mary did so the plane. Right? Because do so doesn't select for anything. Direct objects are always selected for. You get them just if the verb is a transitive verb. And do so isn't a transitive verb. It's almost not a verb at all. Yeah. Does that accord with people's intuitions that you can't say that? Yeah. Okay. In fact, I'm going to star it before anybody gets the wrong idea. Yeah. Bad sentence. Bad sentence. No biscuit. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah. Could you? Say I chose the boat and Mary the plane. Yes. Good good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I chose a boat and Mary a plane. Or I decided on a boat and Mary on a plane. Can you say that? I 
I, I live in Somerville and Mary in Alston. You can have prepositional phrases in this construction. But maybe not selected ones? Because I, I decided on the boat and Mary on the plane. It feels kind of adjuncty to me. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. Works, but it's still vague. Is that what you said? It could mean either one. OK, good. I was sort of hoping that was true, because I don't know any reason why it wouldn't be able to mean either one. Um, this is a really interesting uh, phenomenon. There's a lot of work on it. It's called gapping. Uh, and um, uh, dissertations have been written. Yeah. <laughs> interesting stuff. Yeah. Oh, no. What did Mary do on the plane? Chose the boat. Oh, she chose the boat on the plane. Oh, yes. Well, that would be OK. <laughs> yeah. Phew. Uh, I thought you meant that she chose the plane. Yes. No, that's, uh, no, that's absolutely right. OK. Phew. Uh, I, yeah, that's a nice example. I decided on the boat. Oh, here. We can use this tree. I decided on the boat, and Mary did so on the plane. I was, um, uh, I was taking that to mean, yeah. Uh, decide in the first clause is taking an adjunct on the boat, and in the second clause, well, do so is uh, just replacing decide, and on the plane is another adjunct. You're saying, yeah, on the plane is an adjunct, all right, uh, but do so is replacing the entire verb phrase decide on the boat, where on the boat is an argument. Right? And yes, that's another reading that it ought to be able to have. I was just ignoring that reading. Thank you for pulling that reading out and making me pay attention to it. You're absolutely right. Yeah? Cool. All right. So yeah, arguments versus adjuncts. Uh, decide on the boat on the plane. Uh, on the boat is an argument. It means I chose. This means I chose the boat on the plane, uh, at least on the most natural prosody. And uh, 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 we're, we've now seen two ways of distinguishing arguments from adjuncts. One is. Uh, if you have anything left over after VP pronominalization, uh, anything that's outside, do so. Anything that's still there had better be an adjunct and not an argument, because do so doesn't select for things. Um, and if you have both an argument and an adjunct, the argument tends to be closer to the verb than, than the adjunct. Right? Those are the two tests that I've, that I've given you so far. OK? Um, yeah, OK. And then here's a a mini constituency test that's meant to get you to take seriously the possibility that there is a constituent to side on the boat. Look, you can uh, coordinate that constituent with another constituent of the same kind. You can say, Mary will decide on the boat and read a novel on the plane. It's fine. Uh, so OK, the lower thing is the complement. Uh, so terminology break. The lower thing is the complement. Uh, it's, the, it's the sister of the head. Um, so complement is a name that we use for sisters of heads, which, as we've seen, is a a uh, position that's kind of privileged for things that are for arguments, for things that are selected. So um, if there's only going to be one thing that can be, if there's a sort of competition between an argument and an adjunct to be the complement, well, it's the argument that's the complement. That's the thing that gets to be the sister. That's what we're seeing. Um, so here's the principle that I introduced informally a second ago, and I'll now say a little more formally. If you've got a head that's selecting for an argument, what we're seeing is uh, you need to take care of the selection requirements of the head first before you do anything else. You must first eat your broccoli before you can have your dessert. You have to take your core classes before you can switch to taking all linguistics classes. Right? That's, that's uh, the way life is. Um, so if you're going to read books quickly, uh, read is a transitive verb. It can have uh, combined with a noun phrase. Um, and so you're going to want to give it its noun phrase first. Uh, that's the first thing you'll merge with read. Uh, quickly is an adjunct. You can do anything quickly. Uh, it's not getting selected by read. We won't find verbs that can combine with quickly and verbs that can't. And so, yeah, uh, uh, you need to satisfy the needs of read first before you go merging quickly, which is just kind of an optional thing. Um, and that's why the story is going to be uh, we can say he read, the, he read the book quickly, but not he read quickly the book in English. Yeah? In languages that have flexible word order. Yes. <laughs> Let me sit do, down. How do these sentences, uh, the sentence trees work out? If you can 
rearranged. So you're pointing to the fact that there are many languages out there in which word order is a lot more flexible than it is in English. Um, and you know what? Even in English, it sometimes gets more complicated than this. So let me show you the ways in which it gets more complicated in English. And uh, when we get to that, um, we will have a tool that we can use to describe what's going on in the languages you have in mind. Yeah. Um, so let me just get you to hold off on your question for now. Are there any other questions about this so far? OK. All right. In fact, I think we might be about to do it right now. Yeah, so where are we? Uh, trees are constructed by binary merge. Merge is constrained by selection via this thing I just called the projection principle, which says if a head selects for something, then that should be the first thing you merge. Yeah. Before, some of you were tormenting me with questions about heads that seem to be selecting more than one thing. And you can kind of interpret the projection principle in a way that's, that's sympathetic to that. You get to say, yeah, if you have a head that selects for more than one thing, you know, uh, give the children books or put the book on the table, um, uh, yeah, it has two needs, and you had better satisfy those needs as fast as you can, modulo binary merge, right? So uh, give it one of its arguments, and then it still has another argument it needs, so you better merge that one next. Yeah, you, the tools that we have right now make that a possible answer to those kinds of questions. Yeah. Questions still floating around about whether those are the right trees, but those are the trees we expect right now. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah? Yes. So part of the overall play here, that you are trying to make the construction like give the children books. Yeah. Could you would it make sense to instead say that books as an argument is an argument for uh, what you get after you merge like uh, give with this first argument? Uh huh. It's like kind of like uh, Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yes, 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 it is like that. That's a nice way to talk about it. Um, so I've been talking as though, let's see if I can say it coherently. I've been talking as though when we look up give, uh, you know, give is going to say, well, I need two noun phrases. Right? Or at least there is a version of give that takes two noun phrases. Right? You're asking me, oh, wait, couldn't, couldn't, well, first of all, don't we want to say something more complicated than that? Because we saw this with put as well. It doesn't just want two noun phrases. It wants two noun phrases in a particular order. right? So uh, you want to give the children books. You don't want to give the books children, meaning give children books. right? So the, the first noun phrase in this list is the noun phrase that gets the books, gets the second noun phrase. It's not the other way around. Right? And in put the book on the table, uh, Put, yeah, maybe selects for a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase. Uh, but you know, uh, we, need something to, we need to say something more structured than that, because it has to be the noun phrase first, and then the prepositional phrase. It can't be the other way around. And you're wondering, can we say something like, give is a function that takes a noun phrase and can, gets converted into another function that also takes a noun phrase? Something like that. Right? So you know, uh, um, that's sort of the equivalent of currying in or, or Schoenfinkelization or whatever. Um, uh, if you ever study semantics in my department, I have s several German semantics colleagues, so colleagues whose native language is German and they are semanticists. Um, and there were two people who invented um, the kind of uh, uh, functions that he's talking about, where you have a function and it changes the function into another function that takes another kind of thing. Um, one of them had the surname Curry. And the other had the sur surname Schoenfink. Uh, uh, this guy was, I think, British, and this person was German. Um, so if most English speakers refer to this as currying in, but if you are German, you refer to it as Schoenfinkelization. Um, uh, and uh, apparently, Schoenfinkel discovered it before curry. So the, the Germans are uh, annoyed by the fact that we call it currying in. Uh, I'm not German, so I'm not annoyed by you calling it currying in. Um, uh, indeed, we clearly want something more structured than what I'm giving us. Yeah, and I'm just going to leave your point right there. Yeah, so we need to, we need to do something more sophisticated than what I'm what I'm doing here. Uh, I keep hinting at the fact that we're going to want to investigate these trees, the trees that I'm showing you, and with other techniques to find out whether these are the right uh, uh, constituency structures. 
And um, when we do that, I think we'll have another reason to revise what I'm telling you now. Yeah. So there are several reasons to be uneasy about what I'm telling you now. Having, I, I've shown you a theory which works fine as long as heads only have one argument. Yeah. As soon as they have two arguments, these kinds of unsettling questions arise. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to come back to them. OK? Good question. Other questions about this? This is great. I feel like I'm in a graduate seminar. This is like, yeah. OK? All right. So uh, this is where we are then. Trees are constructed by binary merge. We have the projection principle, which says if there's a selection relation, you need to do that merge relation first. Um, and that's going to get us comp contrasts like Mary wrote the novel on a typewriter and Mar versus Mary wrote on a typewriter the novel, where the second one is no good. Uh, because write is a transitive verb, has the option of being a transitive verb, uh, and when it's a transitive verb, it uh, selects for uh, a direct object, and that's the novel. Uh, on a typewriter is like with a feather, uh, you can do anything on a typewriter, you can combine with anything. So it's an adjunct, and uh, so there's no hurry to merge it. Yep. So we've worked our way to the conclusion that write, when it's transitive, absolutely, absolutely has to select uh, an object, and the object has to be the first thing you merge together with right. So it has to be right after right in English. That's why you can say Mary wrote the novel on a typewriter. You cannot say Mary wrote on a typewriter the novel. The novel, the thing that's getting written, it absolutely has to be right next to right. Darn. That last example looks problematic, right? If I ask you, what did Mary write on a typewriter? We've just worked our way to the conclusion that right, when it takes a direct object, the direct object has to be the first thing you merge with right. It has to be right next to right. There can't be anything intervening between right and uh, its complement, the thing that's getting written. What's the thing that's getting written in that example? What did Mary write on the typewriter? Joseph. What? Yeah. Starting like, this sounds like an Abbott and Costello routine. Yes. What's getting written? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, but that's not the sister of right, you know? That's nowhere near right. It's way the heck at the beginning of the sentence. What the heck is going on? Yeah? Are you all emotionally distraught? That's what I'm trying to do, yeah? Okay, good. Um, so, two possible responses. Oh, well, we didn't have time to get too attached to the projection principle anyway. It was just a couple of slides ago. Uh, so much for that idea. Yeah, that's one possibility. Yeah, so apparently um, heads can select for things and they don't have to be anywhere near it. So well. But look, here's another possibility. We could say, no, um, the projection principle is right, is correct. Um, I should have picked a different verb. Um, the projection principle is correct. It is true that a verb like right that selects for an object absolutely has to merge with the object first. And so really what you're doing when you start to ask a question like, what did Mary write on a typewriter, is you are merging right with what? What is starting off as the sister of right? So you start off with something more like, Mary wrote what on a typewriter? And then, apparently, there is some operation that takes what and puts it somewhere else at the beginning of the sentence. Yeah? Um, so a while ago, um, Katerina asked me, what about languages where word order is freer? And I said, things are about to get more complicated. Yeah. Things have now gotten more complicated. Yeah. So yeah, there's selection. Things select for things. And when, th when x selects for y, then y needs to merge with x right away. Uh, and there are adjuncts that can merge wherever they want. And there are things like this, movement operations. I'm going to spend some time trying to convince you that this is true. But right now, let me just assert that it's true. Cases where Indeed, uh, things do merge just the way we've convinced ourselves that they do. They merge where they should. They merge as sisters of verbs. But then something else happens, uh, and they end up somewhere else. Yeah? So there's this operation of movement where you take the word what, and you move it to the beginning of the sentence in order to form questions like this one. Yeah. Notice that in English, and indeed in many languages, most languages, not all languages, but in many languages, um, if I'm uh, amazed by something you've said, if you say, uh, Mary wrote uh, a proof of Fermat's last theorem on a typewriter, uh, I can say, Mary wrote what on a typewriter? Yeah. So it actually is possible to say these words in this order. I just have to be 
in a particular emotional state. I have to be astonished. Yeah. This is actually cross-linguistically extremely common for, uh, they're called echo questions, uh, where if I can't believe what you just said, or if I couldn't quite hear what you just said, you know, if you're telling me on the T, uh, uh, and you say, Mary wrote <laughs> on a typewriter, you know, and there's lots of noise in the background, and I missed the crucial thing, I can say, oh, Mary wrote what on a typewriter? Yeah. Uh, these are called echo questions, where I'm, I'm uh, repeating most of what you just said and uh, replacing part of it with a, with a WH word. And it's extremely common cross-linguistically for it to be possible to leave these words, these question words, like what, uh, in the positions where you would expect them to be in those kinds of questions, in the positions where they would be selected. It's not universal, actually. Uh, there are languages that don't let you do that. If you're um, working on a language, uh, it could be interesting to, to do some finding out about how it forms these kinds of questions. Um, OK, so well, lots of questions about what's going on in this last example. Uh, there are several reasons to think that what is ending up in CP. Um, remember CP? It was the thing uh, that had heads like weather and that, right? So we said verbs like know and think uh, and wonder, I think, was the example I used before. They select for clauses, and in particular, they select for properties of the head of the clause. So um, uh, think can select for a clause that's headed by that. That is the complementizer. That's our word for it in syntax. Uh, that is the complementizer. It introduces that embedded clause. Uh, I don't know whether he ate the ants. Whether is the complementizer that can be selected by no. Uh, you can't think whether he ate the ants. Uh, and uh, actually, there are verbs like no that can have either whether or that. Yeah. Um, with a verb like no that can have whether, it can also have uh, what immediately following it. So you can say, I don't know what he ate. Right? Um, and uh, notice that if it has what, it cannot have either that or whether. So um, uh, you can say, I know that he ate the ants. You can say, I know whether he ate the ants. But you cannot say, and you can say, I know what he ate. But you cannot say, I know what that he ate or what weather he ate. Right? So that and whether and what, they all seem to be sort of in the same slot there. They're in the CP somehow. Yeah. We'll see. They're not quite in the same slot. But the idea that what ends up somewhere in CP, uh, um, uh, that seems to be part of what's going on here. And then, as I said, I promised you there will be various reasons to think that what starts off as the sister of right and moves into CP, but one of them is the one I just went through. Uh, under certain circumstances, communicative circumstances, I can say, Mary wrote what on a typewriter? Like if I couldn't quite hear you or if I, um, if I don't believe what you just said. So here's a tree that we're going to draw for what will Mary write. Uh, it's going to have what? starting off as the sister of right, right where the projection principle wants it to be, right selects for a direct object and it gets one. That's the sister of right. And then it moves uh, to the edge of the CP. Um, and so that's the kind of tree that we're going to draw. This phenomenon, there's a name for it. Uh, it's called WH movement. It's called WH movement because these question words, these words like what and where and why, and when uh, tend to start with the letters W and H in English. Um, who and what and where and when and why and how, which doesn't select, start with the words W and H, letters W and H, but it does contain the letters W and H, just not in the right, the right order. So these words are called WH words. Um, and they're called that, it's just a technical term in syntax. We call these words WH words regardless of the language we're working in. It's a sort of embarrassingly Anglo-centric term. Yeah, so they're called WH words because in English they start with W and H. Uh, the language that you're working on, they surely will not start with W and H, but uh, we're still going to want to call them WH words. And this phenomenon is called WH movement. And it's a cross-linguistically very com common phenomenon. Uh, so uh, English... There's an English example of it there. Again, what did you put on the table? Uh, here's the Tagalog for what did you put on the table. You can see uh, the Tagalog word for what doesn't begin with W and H. Um, uh, Tagalog does have W and H, but words can't start with W and H. Um, and uh, there's the finish for uh, where did I put my clothes? I should really learn how to say uh, what did you put on the table in Finnish. Uh, I don't know why that's my Finnish example. Okay. So various unrelated languages that have uh, WH movement. It's a cross-linguistically very common phenomenon. 
it's not universal. So some of you, in fact, are native speakers of languages in which WH words don't move to the left edge of the clause. They just stay where they are. So in Chinese, for example, uh, if you want to say, what did Zhang San buy, you don't say, what did Zhang San buy, or at least you don't have to. The standard thing to say is literally, Zhang San bought what? Yeah. Which, as I said, you can say in English, but only under special circumstances. In Chinese, that's just the natural way to ask that question, is to leave shema right where it would be as the, the object of the verb. Yeah. And uh, here are a couple more examples. Uh, Bafut, which is a, a language of Cameroon, and uh, Hopi, which is a, a language of the American uh, Southwest. Yeah. Um, so there's cross-linguistic variation in how you form WH questions. There are languages like English and Finnish and Tagalog and many other languages where you take your WH words and you move them to the left edge of CP. And then there are languages like Chinese and Bafut and Hopi where the WH words just don't move. They just stay where they would normally go. Yeah. Um, uh, wherever they would normally go in the sentence. There's no movement going on. So uh, in Chinese, uh, if you wanted to say Zhang San bought a book, instead of what, you would just put the word for book. Yeah. Um, uh, so Chinese normal word order is subject, verb, object, kind of like English. Same deal for Bafut. Uh, Hopi has the verb at the end of the sentence. So these uh, WH words, these words that mean things like what and who, they're just going where the object would normally go in these WH in situ languages. And those are almost the only two options. Take your WH word and move it to the left edge of CP, or leave it where it would normally go. Yeah. You can imagine others, right? So uh, for example, it's not clear that there are any languages in which you take the WH word and you move it to the end of the clause. Um, you can imagine a language like that, but it's not clear that there are any languages in which you say you put on the table what. Yeah. Um, I think my next slides make that observation more complicated. And I think I want to skip them, actually. So, uh, so to make this fact more interesting, let me show you one other kind of cross-linguistic variation. Um, I'm not going to do that, so let me do that fast. We'll come back to this. Um, so because we're running low on time, I want to show you one other, one other quick thing. Um, yeah, in the remaining five minutes, I'm going to set up another thing, and then uh, we'll come back, and, and we'll start here next time. Um, I've been concentrating on WH questions where you're only asking about one thing. In many languages, not all languages, but in many languages, it's possible to ask about more than one thing at the same time. So you can ask questions like, what did you give to whom? Where if I ask you a question like that, what I want is a list of people and things such that person X got thing X and person Y got thing Y. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm asking you if I ask you that kind of question. Um, there are, again, there's some variation. So English, I said, is a language with WH movement. But it's specifically a language with WH movement of one WH. So if you want to ask a multiple WH question, you move one of your WH words, but you leave the other ones where they are. So you say, what did you give to whom? Or what did you give to whom when, where, why, how? Yeah, so all your other WH words just stay where they would normally go. Yeah. There are other languages in which all of the WH words move in this big mooing herd to the beginning of the clause. So in Bulgarian, for example, uh, you don't ask literally, what did you give to whom? You ask literally, what to whom did he give? Yeah. So what and to whom are both at the beginning of the sentence. There are a bunch of languages like this. Mohawk is another one. Uh, Mohawk is a uh, language spoken in uh, not too far from here um, uh, in uh, parts of America and Canada. These are both languages in which uh, the WH words all have to move in a multiple WH question. And again, so there's some variation between languages. There are languages that move one WH word, like, like English. There are languages that move no, bless you. There are languages that move no WH words, like Chinese. There are languages that move all the WH words, like uh, Bulgarian or Mohawk. And again, it's not too hard to imagine other options. So for example, you could imagine a language that only moved two WH words. That would be a language where you would say, uh, who what gave to whom, to mean who gave what to whom. Yeah. Um, there aren't any languages like that. The only kinds of languages there are are the English kind. So first, the Mandarin kind, the Chinese kind, where you don't move any of them. The English kind, where you move one, where you say who gave what to whom. And the Bulgarian Mohawk kind, where you move them all. You say who, what, to whom gave. Yeah. 
There aren't any languages like this that, that just move two or move up to two. You could imagine a language like that, but there, but there aren't any. Um, and uh, let me just leave you with this last point, and we'll probably take it up here again last, next time. Um, uh, logical problem of language acquisition. So here's a, here's, a, here's a game we can play. Here's a function. Uh, it's a function that if you give it one, the answer is one. If you give it two, the answer is two. If you give it three, the answer is three. If you give it four, the answer is four. What do you think the answer is if you give it five? Five. five? Anybody think of any other options? Ha, you've fallen into my trap. The function that I actually had in mind was this one, <laughs> such that the answer is 29. In fact, the answer could be anything at all, right? So this is the kind of uh, question you sometimes get asked on standardized tests. And it's always unfair, uh, because the, the answer could be anything at all. That first thing, which I carefully devised to be 0 as long as the thing I was giving the function was 1, 2, 3, or 4, uh, you could multiply that by anything. And so 5 could be, could be any number. Yeah. Um, life is like that a lot. There are lots of places where you go through life and you get a certain number of finite observations of uh, how life works, and then you have to make a decision about what the basic rule is. You know, so if you're doing science, let's say. You go out there, you see uh, many white swans. Um, at some point, you have to decide, have I seen enough white swans that I get to decide that swans are white? Right? Have I seen enough black crows that I get to say that crows are black? Right? You never know. Maybe the next one is going to be purple right? or green. You know, it's just hard to know. And this function is sort of a dramatic example of that. Imagine, just in the remaining seconds, that you are a Bulgarian child. Were any of you Bulgarian children? OK, so just imagine counterfactually that you were a Bulgarian child. Uh, here you are growing up, uh, hearing your parents uh, ask WH questions. And um, there's got to be some number, n, that is the largest number of WH words you ever heard in a question, right? Um, maybe you heard your parents say two WH words in a question. Maybe you heard them say three. It's kind of unlikely that you ever heard them say four or five. I mean, it depends, I guess, on what your parents' line of work was. Right? But there's some number that's the largest number, and it's probably different from Bulgarian to Bulgarian. So what we might expect, so Bulgarians are sort of in the position you guys were in um, with that function. If you just hear this, let's say, uh, what to whom did he give, uh, you got to ask yourself, is the rule move all the WH phrases? Is it move two of the WH phrases? Is it move maximally three, maximally four, you know, whatever? Um, there are literally infinitely many rules that are compatible with this data point, right? And so you might have expected that Bulgarians, depending on how weird their parents were, would grow up with slightly different grammars. That, you know, when you took Bulgarians and you put them into a hyperbaric chamber and you gradually added WH, question, WH words to the questions, that they would diverge, you know, as the questions got more and more complicated. That there would be the, the two WH Bulgarians and the three WH Bulgarians and the four and the five, yeah, that you would find that out. That's not what we find out. The experiment has been done. Um, what you find out is the Bulgarians are all the same. They all move all their WH phrases. What we think is going on, really, is that you know, being a human being means having the kind of mind that can put language together in some ways, but not others. Um, there was never any danger of the Bulgarian children one, entertaining the possibility that the grammar was move to WH phrases. They knew that there aren't languages like that. Uh, human languages don't work that way. This is what we mean when we talk about universal grammar. We'll review this next time, because we're out of time. But we'll talk more about this next time.